Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. Now I finally got my hands on the version two of the Miu Mini. And this new version has a couple key new features. And probably the most important thing is that they've modified the case so that the D-pad and the face buttons are more responsive. And this was one of my main complaints about the original Miu Mini. And so I'm pretty excited to test this out. On top of that, the screen on this device has also been updated. It is now OCA laminated. Now the screen on the original Miu Mini was quite good, but this layer of lamination takes it to another level. And I decided that since we're going to be in here and talking about the Miu Mini, now is a good time to also do an update video to the custom firmware options we have available. For example, Onion OS has had quite a few updates since my last video, and we have a brand new firmware available for the device too. This one's called Mini UI. And so in this video, in addition to comparing version 1 and 2 of the Miu Mini, I'm also going to show you how to set up the latest version of Onion OS as well as Mini UI. And believe it or not, this is not going to be my final Miu Mini video. And that's because the company just released two new color options, which are now available for purchase. And I bought both versions, and I'll be sure to check those out as soon as those come in the mail. But for now, let's just focus on the additions to the version 2 of the Miu Mini and some of the potential that's unlocked using the custom firmware. And so, without any further delay, let's jump into it. Okay, to start things off, the new Miu Mini comes with its own travel case. In fact, it doesn't come with a box at all, it just comes like this. And I think that's pretty cool, it saves on packaging materials. It also comes with a USB SD card reader, as well as a micro SD card filled with the firmware and some games. There's also a charging cable, and of course, the device itself. Now overall, the design of this device has not changed in any way. It's still the exact same device that we reviewed previously in other videos. And so if you want a detailed dive into like these back buttons and things like that, I recommend checking out those videos instead. But to give you a quick primer, you know, you have your face button start and select and a menu button here on the front. Up top, you have a power button as well as LED indicators for when you're charging or just have the device on. On the left side, they have a volume wheel and I feel like this is the perfect positioning for it. It's just far enough inset that you won't accidentally adjust the volume. On the bottom, we have a headphone jack, the micro SD card slot, and then the USB-C charging port. Now, one of the changes from version one to version two is a different battery. This one has a slightly larger capacity of 2000 milliamp hours, and it plugs directly into the device itself. The other one was a user replaceable battery. We'll show that off here later. So that's the first major change from the version two. The next one I want to talk about are the face buttons and D-pad. Now these actually have not changed, but what has changed is the size of the hole surrounding the buttons. They've widened them just a little bit to make the movement that much smoother. And I gotta say, they're just about perfect at this point. The face buttons are nice and responsive, they spring back perfectly, and the D-pad has just about a perfect amount of travel and wiggle to it. The previous D-pad was super tight, but by comparison, this one feels a little bit loose. And it's almost exactly like how the original SNES and NES D-pad were. So I think both of these are a home run. They're a pleasure to press down on compared to the version 1. And finally, the other big change to version 2 is that the screen is now OCA laminated. But like I mentioned in the intro, the screen was already good. So in a moment, I'll turn this on so we can get a better comparison. But for now, let's compare the other aspects of the version 1 Miu Mini. And this one came out just before Christmas, so about six months ago at this point. And at the time I'm making the video, my major complaint about it were the face buttons and D-pad. They were just too tight. They would scrape against the sides of the shell, and they just wouldn't feel very good. Now, unfortunately, I wiped my buttons not too long ago, so you can't really see all the dust that's accumulated. But here on the D-pad, you can see it here in the corners. And that little bit of dust there comes from scraping against the sides of the case. And there are ways to fix this. You could sand down the inside of the case or you could add a little bit of oil. But at the end of the day, it just becomes a major pain. I mean, overall, the D-pad and buttons were decent, but by comparison to other devices, they just felt too tight. Now, one thing I did really appreciate about the version one is the user replaceable battery. As you can see here, it only had 1900 milliamp hours, but it was super easy to take in and out and you could buy spares on eBay. And so yeah, those were the things that were different about the version one. For me, the biggest improvement is just how much better the D-pad and the face buttons are on version two. You could argue that maybe the D-pad is a little bit too loose, but to me, it feels more accurate compared to the Nintendo and Super Nintendo. And the responsiveness of these face buttons to me are just about perfect. So now let's do a screen comparison. We'll do the version one here on the left first. Now in terms of color saturation, they look just about right. But that tends to change when you put it at a little bit of an angle. And it's kind of hard to pick up on the camera, but the color starts to get washed out when you start to angle it. And the blacks also become very hazy and gray. By comparison, the OCA laminated screen on version 2 doesn't really have that problem. It maintains that nice black color even when I'm switching it over to an angle. And the other tiny aspect to this here is that the OCA laminated screen just makes the characters and sprites pop out a little bit more from the screen. 
And it's kind of hard to put into words, but when I'm playing them side by side, it's a night and day difference. And so I think my final verdict between the two here is that yes, the screen is improved, but the screen alone isn't worth upgrading from a version one if you already have it. However, if you have a version one and you find that you don't really like the buttons or the gameplay experience, I found that the improved D-pad and face buttons have completely transformed the way I approach this device. Previously, this was a device that I wished was better, and now honestly, it's a device I have very few complaints about. Long story short, version 2 is much better, but I'm not quite sure it's worth buying a new one if you already have version 1. However, if you don't already have one of these devices, then version 2 is completely worth your money and time. Okay, so now let's talk about software. We'll start with the stock operating system experience, just so you can kind of get an idea of what to expect when you first turn this device on. Now the thing about this device is that technically the firmware resides on the internal storage of the device. The card itself is just the launcher and shell. And so even when I show you custom firmwares here in a minute, they're not actually firmwares, they're just custom launchers that have been improved greatly from the stock experience. But overall, this is what you can expect when you first boot the device up. There will be a game section here. You can navigate to your system and then navigate to the games too. And that 32 gigabyte card will have a good amount of games for each of these systems already loaded. Now, of course, the game list isn't going to be perfect. For example, with the Nintendo Entertainment System, all of the games that have been loaded are the Japanese versions, unfortunately. But it seems to be on other systems that doesn't seem to be the case. But there's definitely some duplicates. For example, there are 1300 Game Boy games on this device. That's kind of crazy. And in general, the emulators that they're running on this are not very well optimized for the device itself. And that's where custom firmware is going to come in. It's going to improve the user experience as well as your performance in some of those more demanding systems. In terms of demanding systems, the highest this device can play is the PlayStation 1. And it actually comes loaded with a few PS1 games. However, many of these are also not the English translation versions. As you can see here, this is a non-English version of Castlevania Symphony of the Night. And so in a pinch, yes, you could just buy this device and immediately play the games that are on it. There's actually no requirement or need to install custom firmware. So it could be one of those things where you could try it out for a week or so, and then once you're more comfortable with the device, then you can dive into the custom firmware selection. But before we do that, let me show you the settings menu here because there are some important things in here. For example, you can adjust the brightness overall, but then within the color menu in the settings, you can actually adjust the saturation point and there are other color balance options. Another thing I want to mention is that in the device info, you can see that the firmware on this is dated to January of 2022. And that will come into play later when we try to add Onion OS. For now, we're going to turn the device off. We're going to take the SD card out and then put it in our computer. One thing that's pretty common about the SD cards running on this device is that they will often pop up an error when you plug them into a Windows PC. And the error is going to look like this. It's going to say there's a problem with this drive. You need to scan it. So you can then select scan and repair the drive. And every time it's never actually going to find any problems, but it will remove that pop up. So if that does happen, just follow the prompts. Either way, once you're in the card, this is what it's going to look like. Now, what I recommend you do the first time you plug this in is to back up some of those files. For example, if you go into the ROMs folder and then each of these subfolders will have those game files that we saw earlier. And so if you want to move some of these games over to a new operating system or you just want to save them as a backup, this is where you would grab them. Additionally, I recommend grabbing the system files or the BIOS files from the card too. This is going to be in the RetroArch folder and then the .RetroArch folder here. And then finally, the system folder within. And inside here, you're going to find all sorts of BIOS files. This is just a generic BIOS pack. And I would say that 90% of these you actually don't really need. But all the same, it's always good to have these on hand. And so instead of having to find them and download them, you can just grab them on this SD card, throw them onto your computer, and you'll be good to go. And these will come into play later on in this video. So once you've gone and saved off those two file systems, we're ready to actually start with the custom firmware. And the first one we're going to try is Onion OS. And I've done videos about this before, but the installation process is a little bit different now so I do want to walk you through that. You'll want to go to the latest GitHub release and I'll have all this linked in the written guide which will be linked in my video description. But one thing to note here is that it requires the April version of the firmware. So because the device is running the January version of the firmware, we're going to have to update it one time. And this is necessary for Onion OS. Luckily, they have an entire guide right here to show you how to do it. And I'm actually going to walk you through those steps right now just to make things easy. First thing you want to do is go to the MIU website and then under software update, you'll find the MIU Mini. And then yeah, right there, you'll find the April version of the update. And of course there might be later ones too, but for now, this is the most recent. After that, you can just follow the prompts to download it via Google Drive. And there's also a PDF, which will talk about some of the features. We're not even gonna get into that. We're just gonna download the zip file. 
Okay, and once you have that downloaded, go ahead and extract the files here. You're going to get a couple different folders. There's two that are called TF card, and inside they actually have the exact same thing. My guess is they accidentally duplicated those two files. Either way, we don't need either of those. Just go into the firmware one, and then you'll find an IMG file. And so all you have to do is grab that IMG file and then move it into the root directory of your stock SD card. After that, eject the SD card and put it back into your device. Now with previous updates, they recommended that you would remove the battery completely before doing the update. And that's because the old user replaceable battery had a tendency to disconnect when it was jostled. Now that it's been directly plugged in, you don't have to worry about any of this at all. And so don't worry about touching the battery, you can just leave it as it is. Instead, all you have to do is just connect it to a power supply via USB-C. Now the power supply does matter. You're gonna wanna use one of those small cell phone ones from back in the day, like the old iPhone plugs. Or honestly, all I do is I just plug it into my PC because it knows how to give the correct amount of wattage. Either way, once you plug it in, it'll prompt the software update just like that. And it's going to take maybe three or four minutes altogether and just kind of leave it and it'll go through the process. Once it's ready, it'll reboot the device and then it'll show this charging logo here. And this logo is a little bit different than the previous one, so if it freaks you out, don't even worry about it. It's just fine. Either way, all you have to do is unplug it and we are good to go. We've updated the firmware. Now, before you actually boot up the device, you need to take the SD card out, put it back into your computer, and then delete that IMG file. Otherwise, it'll keep prompting it to update and you don't want that. Now, there are other things you could do to upgrade the firmware. You can add in some of those TF card files that we saw in the original zip file, but we're not going to do any of that stuff. We're actually going to install the firmware on a new SD card altogether. Now, the size of the card is up to you, but you could do anything from 16 gigabytes, which will cost you something like maybe $7 altogether, or you could go all the way up to 128 gigs for about 20 bucks. In general, you're only going to want to use a larger card if you plan on using a lot of PS1 or Sega CD games, because those files are large. Everything else will fit on a 16 gigabyte card, no problem. Personally, I like to use a 32 gigabyte card. This allows me to put all the retro systems on there and maybe about 20 PS1 games as well. And to me, that's perfect. So I'm going to plug this into my handy micro SD card reader and we're going to put it into the computer. First thing you need to know is that the custom firmwares require the SD card to be FAT32 formatted. And for that, we need to use a special program called GUI Format. And again, links to all this will be in my written guide. But basically, you're going to want to open that app up, close out any other Explorer windows, and then make sure it's set to your SD card, and then give it a name, and then just start the format process. So that's it. The card is good to go. Now we're going to grab the Onion OS firmware so that we can actually install it. And again, we'll go to the latest release on GitHub, and then under the Assets section, you should see a zip file here. So all you have to do is just download that one file. Next, find wherever it is that zip file was saved, and then extract it. It should give you a folder with the name of the version of Onion OS. And inside that folder should be a .tmp underscore update file. If you're not seeing this file, by the way, go into View and then Hidden Items, and you should see it then. Now, the installation of Onion OS is super simple. All you have to do is take that temp update file and then move it over into the FSD card. And provided that the card has been FAT32 formatted, then it should be good to go. Just eject the SD card, and then we'll put it in the device and turn the device on. It'll take about a minute altogether to install Onion OS that first time around, but once it's done, you'll be greeted with this nice little welcome screen. And it'll run you through a quick manual. It'll show you some of the icons that are available, as well as some of the shortcuts to get in and out of your games. After that, it'll go to a section called Grow Your Own Onion. And within here, you can choose whatever systems you want to have supported within Onion OS. And so this is kind of like a choose your own adventure here, but I'm just going to go with the classics. By the way, if you ever want to add more later, you can find this within the app section. For now, I'm just going to press A to select all my favorite systems. And then you can also press right to go to the next tab here and see the available apps. Now, personally, I'm just going to grab every single one of these apps so I can show them off. And then finally, there's another tab with experimental core. And within here, you can find things like Daphne or Final Burn Neo or Easy RPG. And so if any of those interest you, you can install those as well. And so once you're done, you just press start to get things going and it's going to install each of these different systems that you selected. And when it's done, it'll shut off the device. And so all you have to do is just power it back on. And so here we are. This is going to be the main menu here. And it looks a lot like the stock firmware, but it's been streamlined quite a bit too. Under the consoles, you can find the different systems available. And as you can see, the settings is exactly the same as we saw earlier. But a lot of the key differences fall under this app section here. And I'm not going to run through every single one of these because you can find them in the wiki. But there are a couple that I think are worth mentioning. Primary among them is going to be the theme switcher. This one comes preloaded with six different themes that you can just toggle on and off right then and there. And that's super cool when it 
comes to customizing the device to fit your need. But honestly, it doesn't stop there. If you go to their wiki page on GitHub, you'll actually find that there are a couple dozen themes altogether available. And within here, it shows you how to download them and install them and all that other kind of stuff. In fact, if you want to build your own, it even shows you how to do that too. Either way, there's a ton of choice when it comes to themes, which is pretty awesome. Now, if we were to go back into that console section, you would find that if we tried to open up any of these systems, it would be completely empty. And that's because we haven't added any games yet. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to press the power button to shut down. And this is what the file system is going to look like now. And honestly, it looks a little bit intimidating, but you really don't have to touch much within here. What I would recommend doing is copying over those BIOS files that we saved earlier, and then just paste them into the BIOS folder of the SD card. And of course, it'll take a minute to copy all these over. And it also might ask you whether or not you want to replace some files within here. I don't think it makes much of a difference, but I'm going to select skip these files. And then next, the only thing you have to do is go into the ROMs folder and you'll see all your different subfolders here. And then you just want to move your game files over from wherever you save them or wherever you have them stored and then just move them into the corresponding folder. And this is by far the most tedious part of any of this stuff. But if you've ever owned a retro handheld device before, you're probably familiar with this experience. Now, if you're not familiar with the experience, the best place to go is to their GitHub page because in the wiki, it does show you all the supported systems as well as the file extensions for each of those games and then whether or not there are any BIOS files required and the name of those BIOS files too. And so this is gonna be a reference page here as you're adding new files to your system. Anyway, once you've moved over your BIOS files and your ROMs, you're actually good to go. Let's eject the SD card and put it back into our device. And now we're actually ready to rock with Onion OS. So because this is our first time actually starting it up legitimately, let's actually time it here. And my measuring stick when it comes to a good custom firmware is how fast it'll launch. And typically I like something to be under 15 seconds. And as you can see here, Onion OS boots in just about 10 seconds. So that's really great efficiency. And if you go into any of your systems now, you will find the games. And one of the great things about Onion OS is that it uses RetroArch in the back end and it's all been pre-configured for you already. So for example, starting up a Game Boy game, it's going to show the Game Boy boot logo if you have the BIOS installed. And it's already scaled the screen to the appropriate aspect ratio and given a nice colorization to the image as well. Now to exit a game, all you do is press the menu button and it'll take you back to the menu. And of course, to start up another game, you would just press the A button to start it up. But the nice thing about Onion OS is that it'll auto save when you close out of a game, and then it'll also auto load it when you start it back up. And that's one of my favorite features about a small device like this is that you can jump in and out of your games, and Onion OS will help you in that regard. Now, if you really want to get into the weeds and tweak things and stuff, you can press select in the menu button, and that'll bring up the RetroArch menu. But honestly, one of the biggest strengths about Onion OS is that you don't actually have to do all that stuff. Now, a couple of the things I really like about Onion OS, you can go to the left here and it'll have a list of all the recent games that you've been playing. And there's also an app called Play Activity, which will actually track your usage over time. And so you'll be able to see the games that you've been playing the most. Another new feature that's pretty cool is called Guest Mode. And if you turn this on, it'll basically make a new profile for you that won't affect your original profile. So for example, if you wanted to hand this device off to a kid, but you were worried about them messing up your settings, you could set it to Guest Mode, let them mess with it however they want, and then just go into Apps and then turn off Guest Mode again. And then it'll restore all of your settings and you're good to go. It also now has a music player too. So if you wanted to play MP3 files, you could do that. And there's also a real-time clock adjuster if you wanted to use that for Pokemon games. But the last major feature I want to talk about with Onion OS is what they call the Onion Launcher. And this replaced the cartridge mode from previous versions of Onion. And this thing's a little bit different to kind of wrap your head around, but I'll walk you through it. First thing you want to do is enable it and then power down the device. Now, when you power on the device the next time, it's actually going to automatically load whatever game you were playing last. For me, it was this Neo Geo game, as you can see here. And so when I booted up the system, it went right into this. But here's the thing that's really interesting. If you press the menu button to exit out of the game, it doesn't take you back to the main menu, it takes you to the Onion Launcher. And within here, you can actually navigate through your most recent games. And it'll actually show you the moment where it saved it last time. And by pressing the menu button again, you can jump right back into that game. And so what makes this feature so cool is that say there are like five games you're playing at once, if you have them all loaded up in the Onion Launcher like this, you can swap between them super simple. You just press the menu button, go to the next one, press the menu button to launch it, and so on and so forth. And this will work up to 10 games at once. And so if you have a collection of 10 games that you're kind of cycling through as you're playing on this device, the Onion Launcher will simplify that process. And I also find it really cool that you can just kind of browse between the different save states too. Either way, it's a really powerful feature and I think you've probably seen the merits of it at this point too. And so despite being a very feature rich operating system, the Onion Launcher actually simplifies the process by a lot. And because the Onion Launcher bypasses the actual firmware, it has 
has a lot of improved features. For example, the brightness curve is much better for low light gaming, and switching between the games is much faster when using the launcher itself. Now in order to leave the Onion Launcher, all you would do is press the menu button to get into this menu here, and then press the start button to actually get back to the regular Onion OS. And so obviously you can have kind of the best of both worlds here, it's pretty awesome. Now the Onion Launcher won't work on every single system, for example Pico 8 runs a standalone emulator, and this one unfortunately doesn't really jive with the Onion Launcher. But that being said, the Pico 8 emulator has been greatly improved from the last time that I tested it. I threw about a half dozen games at it and every single one played just fine. And so at this point, this is one of the best little Pico 8 gaming machines that you could find out there. But in a nutshell, that is Onion OS. I really like this Onion Launcher to be able to kind of navigate through all your 10 most recent games. And it's super simple to just kind of jump into one and then jump into the other. In general, I would recommend Onion OS for users who want to get the most out of the Miu Mini. Because this operating system has a huge community behind it, and they keep adding or improving upon their features every day. And additionally, if you prefer a graphically guided navigation system, then Onion OS is going to be the best for you. You can navigate through your different systems, pick your games, and and then you're off to the races. But now's the time to talk about the other firmware that's now available for the Miu Mini, and this one's called Mini UI. Now, unlike Onion OS, which is focused on unlocking the potential of the Miu Mini, Mini UI is focused on simplicity. And so the idea here is that the firmware is meant to get out of your way so that you just focus on the games. In terms of games, there's not a lot actually available. It's really going to be mostly the classic systems, things like your Nintendo and Sega systems for the most part. Now that being said, there are community-driven extras, they're calling them packs, and there's a link within their GitHub page to some additional packs that you could be adding. And on top of that, the person that maintains all of these included cores has written on the GitHub page that they could add more upon request. And so if you did want to add additional systems to Mini UI, what I would recommend doing is going to the Issues tab here, and then opening up a new issue, and then maybe putting in that request. Either way, for this video, we're just going to focus on the primary systems that are available within Mini UI. So let's install those now. What you want to do is go to the latest release here, and then there's two zip files available. There's a regular one and then the extras one. The regular one is necessary, but the extras one will include things like TurboGrafx-16. For now, we're just going to grab the regular one, and I'm going to put in a new SD card here, and then I'll also format it to FAT32 using the GUI format tool, and we're good to go. By the way, with MiniUI, you don't have to upgrade the firmware like we did with Onion OS. But of course, it wouldn't hurt if you do want to do that. Either way, to install it, all you have to do is take that zip file we downloaded, then just go ahead and extract it, and it's going to show a bunch of different folders as well as a readme file. If you wanted, you could just open up the readme file and then follow along to all of the instructions. And there are some other handy things in here, for example, it shows some of the shortcuts, and it does show you how to update or where to put your ROMs and all that other kind of stuff. But of course, I'm going to show you how to do all that in this video. And really, to install it, all you have to do is grab those four folders and then add them to that SD card. Next, we're going to eject the SD card, put it into our device. And then power the device on. It takes maybe 15-20 seconds to install Mini UI, and then we're actually good to go. But of course, just like with Onion OS, we haven't added any games yet, so you're not going to be able to see anything right here. So we're going to power down the device, and you guessed it, we're going to take out the SD card, and then put it back in our computer. Now once we're back into the folder here, you're going to find a BIOS and ROMs folder. And I bet you can guess what we're going to do here. We're going to go into the ROMs folder first, and then we're just going to start moving over some of our game files. And if you have any questions about what files are going to be accepted, then I recommend using that readme file I showed just a minute ago. Either way, once you've moved over all your ROMs files, you will want to add some BIOS files to specific systems. Now most of these are actually not required, other than for the Famicom Disk System, as well as for PlayStation 1. And so what you want to do is go into the BIOS folder, then find the appropriate folder there, and then put the appropriate BIOS file inside. Now these files are case sensitive, so make sure that they are all lowercase. And now we're good to go. We're going to eject the SD card, and you guessed it, we'll put it back into the device and then boot the device up. Now this is our first time properly starting up the system, so I am going to time it here. And I was surprised to find that it boots in just a little over 8 seconds altogether. So that is lightning fast. And so this is the user experience. It's all text-based. You can go and navigate the system, then navigate your games, and then boot up your game. And it's as simple as that. Now one thing to note by default is that all the systems are going to be set to integer scaling. And personally, I'd prefer not to use integer scaling on a small device like this. This only has 2.8 inches of screen, and so because of that, I like to maximize the screen space. And this is just a one-time change that you have to do per every system, and I'll show you how to do it real quick. Just press the menu button, and then go into the advanced section here, and then go into options, and then audio and video. Within here, you'll find a screen size option. It'll be set to native, and what I recommend doing is changing it to aspect. 
What that'll do is it'll blow up the screen as much as possible while still maintaining the original aspect ratio. And within these advanced options, there are all sorts of other things you could change if you'd like. We're not really gonna mess with any of this. But as an example, you could change out the control scheme and you could also add hotkeys on a per system basis. For example, if you wanted to add hotkeys for save states and load states, or maybe a special button to toggle fast forward on and off. Either way, all of those are available to you if you want. Just make sure once you've got it how you want it to go into save config, and then you can select save global config. And so that'll save all these settings for the entire Nintendo system. And as you can see here it is filling up the screen while maintaining the correct aspect ratio. Now, even though mini UI looks super simple, it's actually very powerful. For example, if we go into menu and then select save to do a save state, and then say we go and quit out of that game, what we can do now is either press the A button to jump into the game, or we can press the X button to actually resume that save state right then and there. And watch how fast this boots up. Bam, look at that. So this is easily one of my favorite features about mini UI is that you can save your state and then launch it directly by pressing the X button and it opens up super fast. And to me, for the Miu Mini, that's a very important feature because this is a grab and go device. So let me show you a couple other examples. For example, if we jump into Game Boy, as you can see here, it is integer scaled again, and the colorization is based off of Game Boy Light. And you might like this, but personally, I like something to be a little bit more green. So we'll go back into Advanced, then Options, Audio and Video. We'll change the screen size from Native to Aspect again. And if we jump out of it again, you can see it is now filling out the screen. Now let's go back into Advanced and then Options. And then under Emulator Options, you can see here there's options to change the colorization. So personally, I'm going to change it to Special 1, which is the same one that's used in Onion OS. And there, as you can see, it looks really nice. Finally, we'll go into Advanced and then Options and then Save Config so that we can save this across all Game Boy games. And that's it, the same process here, we can go and save a save state, then exit out of the game, and then press the X button and we'll jump right back into that exact same spot. And much like with Onion OS, this also has a recently played section in the top menu. So within here you can go through the games that you've played most recently. Now I've been talking a bit about this whole save state and then launching back into it, but there's actually even easier of a process. So instead of going through and hitting the menu button, then save and then quit, and then the X button again to resume it, all you really actually have to do is just power off the device. So if you hold the power button for a second, it'll say that it creates a quick save and then powers off the device. And now, as you can imagine, when we start up the device again, it's actually gonna boot directly into that game. And so to me, that's kind of the best of both worlds. You have a very simple system to kind of work with, but it also has a very powerful backend that is both simple and intuitive. And so essentially, you could just turn on a game, hand it to anybody, and then just tell them when you're done playing the game, just push the power button to turn it off. And then when they press the power button again, it'll jump right back into that game. As you can probably imagine, there's a world of possibility within this little system. Okay, so now I want to briefly talk about performance. Like I mentioned before, this can play up to PS1, but there are some games that are going to struggle. For example, the more intensive Super Nintendo games, things like Super Mario World 2, they're unfortunately not going to run at full speed. They're going to run around 55 frames per second, so you'll get a little bit of stuttering. But within that advanced options menu, there is an option to turn on frame skip. And you can tweak this however you want. I'm just going to set it to the automatic settings. And as you can see here, immediately it starts playing at full speed. Now the gameplay itself isn't going to be quite as smooth, so it is a relatively compromised experience. And this is really only going to be necessary for about four games. That's going to be Star Fox, Mario World 2, Mario RPG, and then Final Fantasy 3. Everything else will play just fine. Now for PS1, it actually already has auto frame skip enabled by default. And so yes, the hardest games to play on the system, things like Bloody Roar 2, they are going to run at relatively full speed, but it's because they're taking advantage of frame skip. So I would say not every PS1 game is going to play very smooth. But that being said, I think the Mio Mini really excels in playing role-playing games, especially on PS1. And luckily, most of these games aren't going to require that much performance. And so yes, there are going to be PS1 as well as a couple Super Nintendo games that aren't going to play perfectly. But again, we're talking about the top 1% of the games in terms of performance requirement. Everything else is going to play just fine. Now, in addition to getting the V2 of the gray model, I also picked up the white model, as you can see here. Now, there's no real differences between the two other than the coloring. Of course, the shell is white, but then the face buttons are also colored, and they're modeled after the Super Nintendo color. But the face buttons are also colored, and they're modeled after the original Super Nintendo from the European and Japanese versions. And honestly, I've been using this one more than the gray one. Even though I like the nostalgia of the brownish-looking gray, the pop of those face buttons are just kind of really neat. Now, when it comes to these two operating systems, I'm not really sure which one I actually like the best. 
And at the end of the day, there's no competition here. I think they serve actually two completely different purposes. MiniUI is meant to be a very simple operating system designed for those classic systems only. And so if you want to focus on Nintendo and Sega classics, this is going to be a really great experience. Now, Onion OS can do a lot more than MiniUI. It has a visual navigation system. It has an easily accessible version of RetroArch available in the back end. And of course, all sorts of cool little apps and features as well. So when it comes down to it, it's really going to be up to your gameplay style. Are you just going to focus on a couple games and do they happen to be Nintendo and Sega games? Then MiniUI might be a great fit. Or do you like a little bit of tinkering with your retro device? In that case, you might like Onion OS. Additionally, if you want to cycle through a number of games at once, then I think the Onion Launcher is a really great feature for that purpose. But of course, Mini UI will allow you to jump in and out of games pretty quickly, but the experience is a little bit different. It's not quite as visual, but it is super fast and sleek. And so of course, when I'm presented with any large amount of data, I like to break it down into a graphic, and this is it here. As you can see, Onion OS supports about 120 systems altogether, and it's got some great features like a theme switcher and that Onion Launcher we showed before. The way I like to characterize it is that Onion OS makes the most of the Miu Mini. Meanwhile, the Mini UI is focused on getting out of the way so that you can play your games. There are only 11 systems available, plus some additional packs if you want to add them, but it features a very simple setup and menu system, and the settings menu is universal across the board so it's very easy to understand once you get the hang of it. And and of course, booting up and resuming your games is super fast, and I love the ability to just turn off the device and jump right back into my game when I turn it on. So in the end, these are both incredible operating system experiences, but it's really going to come down to how you play your game. Now, another thing you might be asking is, hey, you did a video about the Mio Mini versus the Ambernic RG280V a few months ago. And in that video, those two systems were neck and neck in my scoring system. But at the end of the day, I said that I actually prefer the 280V over the Mio Mini. And a lot of that had to do with the D-pad and face buttons. As you can see here, I gave it a 6 on the Mio Mini versus a 9 on the 280V. And so you might be wondering if my mind has changed with this new version 2 of the Mio Mini. And I would say you are absolutely correct. Here is my updated scoring for the version 2 of the Mio Mini. And as you can see, it blows the 280V out of the water. The D-pad and face buttons aren't quite perfect, but they are much better. And the improvements to Onion OS as well as this new Mini UI pushes this device all the way to a 10 out of 10 when it comes to the software and the user experience. Additionally, it seems like Mio Mini has caught on to the fact that this is so popular because they've been manufacturing a ton of these devices, including new colors. And so I think this is a device that's going to be available for a long time to come. Either way, yes, I'm here to admit that I think the Mio Mini is now the best micro device that you can find for the money. And it coming in at around $60, this thing is a steal. The amount of joy that this little thing can give me is just kind of crazy. And like I said before, I've been playing the white more than the gray one, which is kind of surprising to me too. And, believe it or not, I've been using Mini UI more than Onion OS lately. But again, I think that really comes down to playstyle. For me, I like to focus on just one or two games at a time. And so for me, the seamless integration of Mini UI has been really good for me. I'm actually about an hour into Chrono Trigger right now, which is the furthest I've ever been in that game. Who knows, maybe one of these days I might actually finish it. Either way, let me know what you think in the comments below. Do you have version 2 of the Mio Mini and do you love it? Or do you have the version 1 and now you're tempted to get the version 2? And finally, do you not have either of these devices, but are you now thinking about picking one up? Either way, let me know if you have any questions in the comments below, and I'll have buying links in the video description if you want them. As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful. And we will see you next time. Happy gaming.